This is Metrosource Minis, the official podcast of Metrosource Magazine and home of short-form interviews with your favorite personalities from the LGBTQ world and beyond. Quick, fun, and informative, it's Metrosource on the go. Out and proud since 1990. Out and proud since 1990, the year I was born. Just kidding. This is Metrosource Minis. I'm your host, Alexander Rodriguez, lead writer for Metrosource Magazine and avid podcaster. So on-air personalities like myself and the myriad of other LGBTQ newscasters, entertainment show hosts, other podcasters, you name it, owe it to the pioneers who took the leap as out-of-the-closet media personalities before anybody else did. And today I chat with Emmy winning uh, TV star, best-selling Arthur, Carson Kressley, of course we know him from Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and RuPaul's Drag Race, uh, who was also our Pride issue cover girl uh, on newsstands around the nation or metrosource.com. Okay. <laughs> he comes from an extensive career as a competitor in equestrian events, by the way, many years in fashion, having worked for Ralph Lauren for a number of years, and of course, reality TV. In addition to Queer Eye and Drag Race, he was seen on How to Look Good Naked, Jeopardy, Celebrity Apprentice, Worst Cooks in America, and of course, Dancing with the Stars, just to name a few. And as a red carpet maven, he is no stranger to E! Entertainment or Good Morning America. The list goes on and on and on. Please welcome Carson Cressley. That's me. I I'm, I'm, I'm sound like a reality TV ho. I've been all over the place. <laughs> Well, you know, but you you make it work. Um, so you know, I I don't want to get started off too serious, but we do have something serious to talk about. Sure. Um, all gay men are supposed to dance, aren't they? What happened on Dancing with the Stars? You know what? They're so I think they're supposed to know how to move, and I will tell you, I did not get that gene, so it's okay. Some of us, you know, we're not fully blessed, uh, and. Uh, I'm actually very good. If you took me to the club and gave me 14 tequilas, I'm a fantastic dancer. <laughs> um, but when you have to do it in front of like, you know, 10 million people on live television in a sparkly pirate outfit, um, it's more daunting for some reason. <laughs> You know, it's very um, it's very difficult to think of you as a shy boy. And I know during your interview with Metrosource, you were a shy boy. Did you think it was competing in the equestrian events that kind of brought out your personality? Um, yeah, I was very shy. You know, like all of elementary school, I was, you know, the quiet kid. And, um, you know, a part of it I, I will attribute to, you know, maybe being bullied and not being um, comfortable with who I was as a young adult and a teenager and a preteen, you know, when you get picked on, you find a coping mechanism. You think, hmm, how am I gonna distract these people so they don't clock me on my Calvin Klein jeans in the fourth grade? And you develop a sense of humor and a personality as kind of a shield. And uh, I think that's where I got my sense of humor. I was just like, if I can keep people laughing, uh, then they're not going to bully me. So. Uh, uh, that's, you know, the ultimate silver lining, I think, because it's been a great um, help in my career, in, in, in whether it was showing horses or working for Ralph Lauren or, of course, doing television. Now, did your family kind of have an idea? You know, this young kid is very particular about his jeans, his outfits. They must have known early on that you were uh, you were a little different. You were uh, special. Yeah, I mean, I literally have, like, my kindergarten picture, and I have painted nails and, like, a little Paisley <laughs> shirt on. And uh, it was, yeah, I think they kind of got the memo at about age three. <laughs> well, you know, people say, I, I woke up like this. Uh, you were just born like that. You know, you were born that way. I um, was. I was. The doctor slapped my ass and I was like, oh, that was great. And he's a doctor. Doctor. <laughs> now, Carson, how come we haven't seen you in a horse-related reality TV show? Horses are still a big part of your life. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on a horse farm and that's something I've always done and it gave me such a great uh, worldview because I got to travel and meet all kinds of very different people all over the world doing that. And uh, and I still do it. I'm, I'm actually going to a horse show tonight um, in San Diego. And um, I don't know why we haven't done a reality show yet. I did, uh, I have a farm in Pennsylvania and I've done a bunch of shows there for Food Network and Animal Planet and Antiques Roadshow. Uh, but we haven't done something specifically on horses, but I am uh, hopefully producing something in the very near future uh, about uh, the incredibly competitive and wacky world of uh, 
equestrian competitions. So stay on the lookout. You know, if it's not out there, you got to make it happen. So I'm trying to do that myself. That's exactly right. In my mind, I imagine this waiting for Guffman style, like mockumentary almost. I mean, I would be yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, maybe that or a little bit of dance moms thrown in, you know? <laughs> I could just see Abby Lee Miller wheeling herself in <laughs> in a crowd of horses. Now, Carson, we see you on every uh, TV show imaginable. I feel like we feel like we really know you um, and that you're, you're kind of ours, so to speak. We look at your social media. It's very positive. It's colorful. It's sassy, very on point and branded. But is there a private side to you that you choose to keep off camera? Uh, no, not really. I mean, uh, I think sometimes my, my family, you know, sometimes when I uh, either have them on a TV show or in my social media, they're like, oh, we didn't sign up for this. We don't want to do this. So I kind of keep them um, wherever they feel comfortable. But as far as me and my life, um, it's pretty open. You know, you can see all the details on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or Grindr or Scrub. Um, <laughs> Are you I'm really on Grindr? What's that? Are you really on, on Grindr? No, I'm not on that one, but I might be on some other ones. Because oh, I am, oh. you know, a, a single lady. Yeah. <laughs> it's because you're so busy. You know, and that's another question I wanted to ask. You you continually are, are in the public eye, continually doing shows. And of course, we know with Drag Race and, and Queer Eye, you've also become a spokesperson for the LGBTQ community. Do you feel that you're personal life your personal journey has had to take a back seat such as you you are a single guy you're you're busy it's hard to pin you down well uh oh it's actually not that hard to pin me down but i am busy <laughs> um yeah i mean i think everybody has to you know learn how to balance you know work and family and their love relationships and um certainly being busy has been a blessing and i love it um and I think, you know, everything is about timing. And I think now I'm ready to, you know, find somebody and settle down. You know, I'm not getting any younger. And, um, but, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not mad about any of it. I think it's all meant to be, you know, it's all fate and timing. And when it's supposed to happen, it will happen. Okay, so I have to know if somebody was gonna slide into your DMs, mm. you know, to you know, to woo you, so to speak. What kind right. of DM would you, what kind of DM would you be responding to first? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, um, I think somebody who's actually done their homework and instead of just saying "sup, bro," um, actually, <laughs> you know, comments on something like. I saw your show on E and I thought it was really good. Or I love the picture you posted of your horse or whatever. Um, just, you know, you have to kind of make an effort. Not that okay. big of an effort, but just a small one. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, because of your roles in prominent LGBTQ media projects, you have become this spokesperson, this role model for the community. It kind of came with the job. It's not like you filled out an application to be an activist. How right. have you grown into that role and how has that aspect changed your life? Um, for me, it's very organic. Um, I just do me, you know, ever since Queer Eye, people were saying, you know, um, what are you out there promoting? What are you trying to do? I'm just, I'm just living authentically and it happens to be on reality television. And for a lot of people that is, um, that visibility and that authenticity is a very powerful combination because, you know, literally I would, you know, 17 years ago when Queer Eye for the Straight Guy came out, I would be traveling somewhere and I'd be in an airport and people would be like, I never knew any gay people. I never met a queer person. I was like, what, have you never been on an airplane? Have you never had your hair highlighted? <laughs> um, certainly you've, you've met the gays before. And um, it was um, that sense of visibility and seeing you as a person and not as a, uh, a poster child really changes people's minds and attitudes. And they say, well, you're a lot more like me than I realized. And you seem like a great person. Why shouldn't you be able to adopt or get married or all those things? Um, so it helps push equality forward. Um, I, you know, try to keep it casual and just, you know, do my thing. I do feel very strongly about supporting LGBTQ youth. Uh, and I've worked for a long time with Cindy Lauper on the True Colors United. Um, you were... Uh the the host you were her MC 
Yeah, we do a concert every year. We raise a lot of money uh, because unfortunately, gay kids, queer kids tend to be at a much higher risk for homelessness because they are still getting turned away by their families or, uh, you know, certain faith-based shelters may turn them away. So uh, it's a real problem and Cindy wanted to tackle it and a bunch of us got together and uh, it's been almost, I think, uh, 20 years and um, we've done some great work and passed some great legislation and uh, we're making sure that um, LGBTQ kids uh, have a voice and are seen and are, are hopefully not subject to homelessness because it's a totally uh, fixable problem. Well, and on behalf of the shy, you know, gay kids growing up, I was once shy, believe it or not, um, you know, uh, seeing people identified with in the media, it, it, it just shapes uh, a life. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, when you saw the casting call for a show called Queer Eye, we know Bravo was some small cable network that people are like, what? Um, and then to have a show that the title actually is like, we're queer, like there's no secret here. Uh, was that a weird casting call to get? And what made you respond to that? Because you really kind of had to come out to the world. Yeah, I mean, there really wasn't, I didn't even know there was a casting call and I didn't even know what casting calls were. And it was so serendipitous. And I, I, it's like, I totally believe in uh, fate and destiny mm -hmm. because I, I shouldn't have even known about this show. I worked for Ralph Lauren, I was a fashion stylist. I didn't work in the television space. But one of my producers at Ralph Lauren said, oh, I heard about this show, it's gonna be on Bravo. And I was like, what's that, a nonstick cooking spray? <laughs> and. Um, uh, she said, no, you should go and try out for it. So I just, I literally went downtown uh, in Chelsea in the city and uh, to a casting place where they did like Domino's pizza commercials and Charmin. And I went into a room and they showed me a tape of a straight guy. And they said, what do you think? And there were, you know, a bunch of other contenders and they were very earnest and uh, talked about building bridges between our communities. And I thought that was lovely. But when they got to me, I was like, listen, the guy's hot. Can we just get him out of the pleated khakis and get rid of this mullet and he'll be a total smoke show. Let's do this. And they're like, okay, we like your attitude. Um, and I think that was it. I think they were like, okay, we're going to hire you. And then we made a pilot in 2002. And uh, again, I didn't think anything was really going to happen. And then by 2003, NBC Universal had purchased Bravo. They loved Queer Eye. They wanted to make it the centerpiece of their rebranded network. And um, the rest is her story. Now explain to me your time at, at Ralph Lauren. You worked there for a number of years and you really worked behind the scenes in a number of ways. Describe to me what, what the fashion world was like at, at that time. Well, it was very exciting and um, you know, I, I do think in New York, there was a heyday of American designers. And of course it started with Halston and Bill Blass and Anne Klein. And, and then, you know, a new generation took over in the eighties. And that was really like, you know, power and excess and glamor and, and fun and fashion. And those were, you know, Calvin Klein and Ralph Lauren and Donna Karen. And um, working with Ralph was fantastic. I did not have a fashion degree. I have a degree in finance and art history. And, um, um, I just knew I wanted to work for, uh, either Ralph or Calvin and I moved to New York city and I got myself an interview and I got myself a job being Ralph's brother's assistant. And it was just like the devil wears Prada. It was high stress and pressure, but, uh, everyone was really nice. Unlike the okay. devil wears Prada. Yeah. And, um, I really flourished there. I loved it. I loved the brand. I loved the culture. I loved the people there. And it was the time when Ralph Lauren was going public. So it was a very exciting time. It was a big company. I think there was 8,000 people working there then. And, um, and we did amazing, fun things. You know, I, I, would, I would eventually um, start styling all of the ad campaigns and photo shoots. So I was, you know, going to Peru in the summer to find snow to do a holiday ad with a bunch of <laughs> gorgeous models and some Samoyed puppies and... Uh, you know, going to the islands in the winter and shooting Father's Day campaigns and working with, you know, Patrick de Marchelier and uh, just great photographers of every kind and um, going to Milan and styling runway shows at the Palazzo and sneaking off to see the um, Dolce & Gabbana show or sneaking off to see um, Versace or go to the Versace uh, Atelier. It was a really fun time. 
Now, are you going to play yourself in the mini series about Ralph Lauren? <laughs> Oh, is there a mini series? No, I'm just joking because we we had Halston, so you know right. all of the designers are going to get there. Are you going to play yourself, or who would you pick to to play you? Um, let's see. I would probably um, I don't know someone who looks a lot like maybe Zac Efron. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah. Although he's um, like daddied out now, so I know. I know. He'd have more, to slim down. He's more of a daddy <laughs> than I am right now. <laughs> um. We see you never get involved in social media drama, a drama, celebrity gossip. Um, you know, you're very sassy, but it's never hurtful or malicious towards other mm -hmm. celebrities. And, and you've been around everybody. I think it's become a rarity in LGBTQ entertainment business because everybody wants to get that laugh or that retweet. Um, and it often comes from putting somebody down or being sassy towards somebody. Where do you get that positive and supportive attitude? Um, uh, well, first of all, I just think we're one big happy community and we need to support each other. So, um, taking down somebody never feels good. Uh, you know, and I'm a big believer of, you know, uh, not laughing at somebody, but laughing with somebody. So I try right. to frame all of my humor in that way. You know, it's never meant to be, uh, derogatory. It's meant to be, you know, observatory or funny and hopefully we can laugh together and honestly i'm just not that into all of the twitter you know back and forth i just don't have the time for that i'm well, i'm busy shopping and you know making riding TV horses shows. <laughs> and riding horses did you ever think that drag race was going to become as big as it has become um Yes, I think so. I, you know, I always knew it was a great show and was a fan from the very, very early days. And I've been doing it now for, I think this is seven or eight years. Wow. And um, we have RuPaul and we have amazing drag queens. And that is a recipe uh, for success. And I think um, certainly it's, it's more successful than I think anybody could imagine. Um, and, um, but it's, you know, it's a great show. The time is right for it. We have a great leader. We have the most amazing producers and crew, and we have incredible Queens that, um, uh, give us new life, uh, every season. So it's, it's a very exciting show to be a part of. I'm thrilled with its success. And just like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, uh, having Emmys and all of that, that's all wonderful. And, and having a hit show is fantastic. But when someone comes up to you on the street and says, oh, because of Queer Eye, I was able to come out to my family and my life was so much easier, thank you. Or because of Drag Race, somebody in, you know, some tiny country somewhere where gay, being gay is probably illegal, they get to see people living their best life and being authentic and being celebrated for that. And I think it, you know, this can be incredibly inspirational and say, listen, there's a whole world out there for you. Uh, just hang on and, um, you know, we, we will love and celebrate you. And I love that you said that because I know uh, as the shows become bigger, there's people that say, you know, drag has become too commercial. It's getting too big. But that big voice is telling the stories that so uh, that need to be told. And I really feel that we've incorporated more of the backstory political and social movement rather than just a reality competition show. So I'm glad that it has a, a bigger voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, exactly. Now, who's who's more apt to be late to set? Visage, Ross Matthews, or RuPaul, or you? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, it's probably me. I mean, um, uh, let's see. I mean, yeah, it's probably me. I hate being early. Because I feel like I'm, you know, I feel like I'm wasting time. I'm like, I could have been doing yes. something. Yes. Um, so I try to get there right on time. So I'm literally like, you know, working from the clock backwards. I was like, oh, it's 29 minutes to the studio. I better leave in 29 and a half minutes. Uh, and, you know, if there's any issues on the way, then I'm in trouble. Yes. yes. Fortunately, um, with all I don't need much makeup. No, you don't. You, I mean, you, you are a flower. Thank um, you. Now I have to know all of the celebrities you've met, all the shows you've done, um, this whole career. 
you know, and it's in a relatively short time. You know, we talk about Queer Eye being so many years ago, but in mm -hmm. terms of the expanse of what you've done in that time, it's pretty, pretty impressive. And I, I don't know when you sleep, but from all of that time, all those experiences, what is one of the craziest stories that you're like, oh God, that memory, that, that was crazy. That was insane. Oh, I have a good one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have been doing showbiz for about 20 years and that's like dog years. Like it's more like 24 years or something, but um <laughs> Uh, one year, and I'm a big Cher fan, I think she's fantastic, and um, she had a movie coming out. This is like 20 years ago. It was the Farrelly Brothers. It was called Stuck on You, and there was a party, and it was in New York, and you get invited to these things, and I entered this big kind of like nightclub, and as I walked through the doors, magically, I got You Babe started playing, and then as I entered the room, there were booths lining it, and a dance floor in the center. And I looked across a sea of people and in the distance I saw Cher at a booth and she was like making eye contact with me. And I was like, what, me? And then she was like this. And I was like, what, I'm being beckoned by Cher? And then I walked over, she's like, hey, who are you? And I was like, oh my God, I, I can't believe this is happening. And I got you, babe, is playing. And um, it was very karmic and I felt like we were supposed to be together. And she um, was lovely and a fan and delightful. and. You know, I had to, was talking to her about like old Sonny and Cher shows and some of the costumes and Bob Mackie. And we were just, yeah. you know, I was like, wait, we might get married. And um, the next day I was going to go interview her for Us Weekly. And I went to her hotel and I was like, what do I wear for Cher? Right. And I wore Roberto Cavalli snakeskin and python pants with purple whip stitching and a pink tuxedo shirt. Understated. Fitted. Understood. Yeah, understood. <laughs> and then I, I was in Brazil and I had one of those necklaces that has like the Jesus and the Mary on both sides. Yep. It's called a scapular. Scapular. Yep. <laughs> and um, I went there and I was interviewing her in her hotel room, like at the Carlisle or something. And she had a sweatsuit on and she had like a do rag, um, like a, a kerchief or a bandana on her hair. And um, her assistant went into the other bedroom of the suite and we sat down and started doing our interview and it was going great. And then at the end, she said, oh, I love that necklace. And I was like, oh my God, Cher, here, take it. And I took it off my head and I was standing above her and I was trying to put it on her and they don't open up. They're actually pretty annoying. And they're made of the finest little gold chain that gets tangled. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm trying to put it over her hair and her kerchief and it's getting stuck and like things are moving and she's like, oh, no. And then <laughs> as I'm hovering over her, the assistant is coming out and she's like, are you assaulting Cher? And I was like, no, 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 I'm just trying to get the necklace on the thing. So it was like the assistant was freaking out. Well, Cher you know was fine. And then, um, I don't know, it was like two weeks later, my phone rang. I was in New York at my kitchen table paying bills and it was like an unknown number. And I was like, oh, I hate answering those, but yeah. I also hate getting the voicemail and then having to call them back. So I was like, hello. And it was like, hello, Carson. And I was like, oh my, help share. And it was share. And she was like, I just want to thank you for the beautiful medallions. I wore them on a hike and now they're next to my bed. And I was like, I can't believe share just called me on my cell yeah. phone. So that's a pretty amazing story for a little uh, gay boy from Allentown. Well, you know, she's going to be getting a biopic. It was just announced with the same producers who did Mamma Mia. So maybe that'll be a scene. And once again, you'll be playing yourself. Yeah, maybe. I better get my team on that. You should. Um, so as we mentioned, you're very on point with your outfits, your looks, your charm. What do you say to somebody? What advice do you have um, or words of encouragement do you have for somebody from the LGBTQ community who doesn't uh, ascribe to all of that. They may feel outside of the picture of what a fabulous gay man looks like. Well, I mean, everybody can define their own version of fabulosity and everybody has great style. They just have to find it. Um, I and I think it's, you know, you don't have to fit in and be like, you know, what you think a fabulous gay man is. You just do your version of you. And I've always, whether it was Queer Eye for the Straight Guy or How to Look Good Naked or, uh, get a room that we just did on Bravo. It's always yeah. about helping people tap into what they love and how can they express that in the best possible way. Um, so th that's what I would tell people, you know, have a style role model. Um, sometimes you have to study it a little bit. Like I'm terrible at math, so I would need to study that if I wanted to be good at it. Same thing with, you know, how you dress and present yourself. If that's not your natural kind of inclination, you need to study it a little bit, but, uh, 
it will come and it's so worth it because I believe more than anything that, you know, your clothes are your armor, your clothes are what you go out into the world with and it can really affect how you feel and make you much happier and more successful when you're doing it right for you. I love that. All right, this last one is for social media. Um, we did the stereo stuff for the article. So uh, tell me, what are the must-haves that every gay man should have in their closet? Oh, gosh. I mean, I mean, for most people and not for everybody, I think um, nowadays you need like a, a chic track pants. That's not a sweat pant. It's more tailored, lighter fabric, almost looks a little dressy. A great sneaker, a great blue blazer, the perfect white button down, fantastic jeans. We all live in denim. You absolutely have to have great jeans. Um, and that's really it. And then you fill it in with all your other things. Yeah. And I always say, you know, invest in great pieces, that blue blazer, that suit, those great um, brown lace-up brogues or whatever. Um, and then have fun with the other stuff. Get stuff at Zara and H&M and discount places and mix it in with the higher quality stuff. Mm. And that keeps it really fresh. You don't, you don't have to spend money on your good quality basics, like your jeans and your blazers. And then seasonally, you have fun with these, you know, more disposable brands uh, to keep it fresh. I could talk to you um, all day. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, tell course. everyone where you want uh, where you want them to find you, follow you, slide into your DMs. At yes, you can find me at Carson Cressley on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Scruff. <laughs> I think people would recognize you. Do, you. do people ever be like, "That can't be you. It must be a catfish." They're like, "Is that is that you, Ellen DeGeneres?" <laughs> um, no, it's um. No, I don't have my actual picture up there right away. They've got to, you know, they've got to do a little reading first and then um, they can find me. All right. Uh, well, I'm on Scrub too, so I'll be looking. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. We'll fit me. <laughs> Carson, thank you. Thank you so much. And for everybody, go get the issue, the pride issue of Metrosource on newsstands across the nation and, of course, at metrosource.com. Carson, you are a scholar and a gentleman. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Bye. Have fun at the horse show. I will. <laughs> that has been my chat with the cover boy, Carson Kressley. You can read my in-depth article, like I said. Uh, we talk uh, a lot more about behind the scenes from Drag Race, also from Queer Eye. And that's our episode. I'm your host and uh, lead writer for Metrosource, Alexander Rodriguez. You can find me on Instagram at Alexander is on air. Until next time, stay true and do you, boo. Happy... That has been another Metrosource Mini. Like, share, and subscribe on your favorite podcast player and check out the latest issue of Metrosource Magazine on newsstands or online at metrosource.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram at Metrosource, and on Twitter at Metrosource Mag. Until next time, stay fabulous. <laughs>